This lecture is on the topic of public lands in the United States and internationally. It's the second lecture in the series from chapter 10 in our AP textbook. And uh, we're going to be discussing national parks, national rangelands, forests, and then also the way international lands are established. So first of all, let's start with international. We have six categories of lands in the international community that are recognized. The first one is national parks. National parks can be designated by any nation. They can be used for recreation, scientific, educational uses, preservation of beauty or habitat, and to generate revenue through tourism. The picture there to the right is a picture of Kruger National Park in Kenya. The second type of lands that are recognized in, international, in the international community are managed resource protected areas. Now these are considered multiple use lands where people can actually extract resources and harvest timber as well as use the land for recreation. So the United States National Forest land is an example of that and that's what the map on the right is showing, the lower map of the United States. So all the green area is National Forest and then in that map the orange area is National Grassland. The third category of international lands are habitat or species management areas. Now these sound like they'd be great for wildlife and a lot of times they are used for conservation, but some of these lands are also used to manage populations for hunting. So for example, um, there are some areas of land that are set aside as duck habitat because people who like to hunt ducks want to have a place where they can go and hunt ducks. So that would be a type of um, habitat or species management area. The fourth type of land is the uh, strict nature reserve or wilderness area and these are established to protect species and ecosystems. The um, picture on the right, the upper picture on the right, is a picture of Chang Tang nat Nature Reserve in Tibet and that's an area that's been, it's been set aside for the preservation of wildlife. We also have a fifth area called protected landscapes and seascapes. Uh, we don't have a lot of these in the United States, but these are basically just very beautiful areas of coastline or land that are open for non-destructive uses. So humans can live there. Um, they can actually have villages or small settlements, um, and they're used for tourism and recreation. And then the last, the last kind of land that's protected internationally is the National Monument. So you have a picture there on the right of the Arc de Triomphe in Paris. The giant sequoias are also considered a natu national monument. Uh, these monuments can be things that are naturally occurring or man-made. And there's a picture there at the bottom of the screen of Stonehenge in England. So these are all examples of categories of international lands. So a quick question to make sure you're following along. Which type of land allow mineral resource extraction? Would that be A, national parks, B, managed resource protected areas, C, strict nature reserves, D, species management areas, or E, national monuments? And I'll give you a second to think about that. If you need a little bit longer time, go ahead and pause the recording, and then you can come up with your answer. And I'm going to reveal the answer now. So the correct answer to this question, the type of lands that allow mineral resource extraction are managed resource protected areas. So these are those multiple use lands where you can extract resources, you can harvest timber, you can hunt, you can also do recreation. Now in the United States we have uh, very similar categories of public lands. So first of all there are multiple use lands that may be used for grazing, timber harvesting, mineral extraction, recreation. These are um, those things like the national forests or national rangelands where people are able to do multiple things on a single piece of land. Uh, secondly, we have the national park system. These are managed by the National Park Service. And in the United States, the activities that are allowed in national parks are very restrictive. Um, you're only allowed camping, sport fishing, hiking, and boating. There's no kind of collection or extraction permitted in national parks. And the national parks are managed to make sure that they're available for future generations. 
The National Wilderness Preservation System is the third main kind of U.S. public land, and this is actually land that's been set aside by several different groups. It forms a network of roadless areas, and that's key there. Wilderness, according to the U.S. definition, is a roadless area. So the access to these areas is usually just recreational activities like hiking, camping, sport fishing, and non-motorized boating. Uh, they're very hard to get to. These are the kinds of places where you know you can't drive there. You park at the edge of the wilderness area, and then you've got to hike in um, because there's no roads available. Now here is a map that shows where all of our different uh, types of protected lands are. And you can see it's color coded. So pink land belongs to the Bureau or falls under the jurisdiction of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Yellow land is the Bureau of Land Management. Um, the Bureau of Land Management manages land that can be used for mineral resource extraction. The Bureau of Reclamation is in purple, which there aren't very many spots that are purple. The Department of Defense uh, manages the blue land. The Fish and Wildlife Service manages everything in orange. You can see there's quite a bit in Alaska managed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as well as some spots in Nevada, California, and Arizona. The Forest Service manages all the light green land. And the National Park Service manages the medium green. And then there's a little section of Tennessee Valley Authority over in Tennessee that's very dark, dark green. And then there's a variety of other agencies that manage those different um, areas listed in brown. Now one key thing to observe in this map here is that the majority of the East Coast has not been protected or set aside for any kind of land management purposes. Um, whereas the majority of the West Coast, you know, on the, towards the, as you go towards the Rockies, the majority of that land has been protected. And um, part of the reason for that is just the history of the way this country was developed. Um, before we really understood what the value of protected land was, we allowed a lot of it to be gobbled up for purposes of agriculture and things like that. So once we realized that land um, could be degraded and needed to be protected, we started to set it aside under federal protection, and that's why the, the West Coast, or the western part of the United States, which was the last area settled, that's why that area is so heavily protected and managed compared to the rest of the country. Now, a quiz question for United States lands. Which type of U.S. lands prohibit mining, hunting, and road building? And I'll give you a second to think about that one. Is it A, multi-use lands, B, national parks, or C, national wilderness preservation areas? And if you haven't got your answer, go ahead and pause the video because I'm going to reveal it now. So the correct answer is that national wilderness preservation areas prohibit mining, hunting, and road building. Now the key there is the road building portion. National parks also prohibit mining and hunting, um, but the national wilderness areas permit, prohibit the road building as well. And on multiple use lands, multi-use lands, like the national forests, we allow mining, hunting, road building, all of that. Now, threats to national parks. So let's focus in on our national parks for just a minute with this slide here. Uh, first of all, they are in very high demand. We've seen the number of visitors to national parks increase exponentially in recent years. They've become much, much more popular as people seek to get away from the city and go out and enjoy the countryside. Along with that high demand and usage come eroded trails. The more people you have walking on a trail, the more quickly it's going to break down. The noise and pollution that all these people bring can uh, cause disruptions to wildlife in the area. And occasionally there are problems with off-road vehicles that wear down the, um, the roads that it do exist in national parks and actually carve paths through habitat that shouldn't be there because people are uh, not obeying the posted signs and not staying on established trails but they're go traveling off-road. All of these people coming in can also lead to the introduction of non-native species. Um, they tend, people tend to bring 
seeds with them unintentionally on their clothing. They may transfer a little bit of dirt from somewhere else that may have some different species of bacteria or eggs for a particular like bug. And so that's how invasive species are transferred from one region to another. Um, car tires, you know, things like that can carry, pick up species and carry them from place to place. Uh, commercial activities that take place in national parks can also be a problem. If you notice in that picture there, um, we've got, this is a picture of Yosemite, Yosemite Valley on a particularly busy day, and the traffic is bumper to bumper, and there are all these cars trying to drive their way through the valley to take a look at everything. And um, this is just leading to excessive air pollution in the valley, noise, congestion, uh, and degradation to the habitat in general. And it's also not a very fun place to spend your time. So these are kind of the th kinds of things that the National Park Service is trying to manage. Um, the biggest challenge, though, that they have currently is that budget cuts and federal regulations that are being changed by various groups that have interests in using this land for other things. Uh, these are making it more and more difficult for the people who manage the national parks to preserve them in a really sustainable uh, fashion in a way that they're going to be still be around and still be beautiful for our children's children. So if you like national parks, you should definitely look into supporting them. I highly recommend that. Um, you can donate money to the National Parks Foundation, um, and they can they help to oversee the national parks and make sure that they that all the funding they need is there and that um, the parks are protected. All right. Finally, uh, when we talk about conserving land or preserving our land, there are several ways that this can happen, and I want to go through these with you very quickly so that you understand when you see them on the AP test which types of land conservation refer to which practices. So first of all we have preservation. Preservation means keeping something or maintaining it intact. So this would be taking land that's already a good wilderness, good wildlife habitat, and setting it aside as a protected area. So if we're preserving land, we're taking something that's already good, already working well as habitat, and we're going to set it aside and protect it. Remediation is the act of correcting a fault or a deficiency. So this would mean that we have land that is degraded in some way, and it needs to be fixed. So for example, um, you could have a stream where the water quality is very poor and has been uh, because of a factory nearby. And so correcting that water quality through its establishing wetlands or um, cleaning up the, the factory, making sure that they don't discharge into the stream, these would all be acts of remediation, correcting that fault or deficiency. Mitigation is one that we saw an example of with Fairview Park. Uh, mitigation means moderating or alleviating something in force or intensity. So one of the best examples of this is that um, whenever a, a company or an organization destroys a wetland through their construction, they have to replace it with a wetland of equal or greater size and functionality somewhere else. So mitigation means that they're moderating or alleviating the, the destruction by replacing it and building something somewhere else. And then restoration means restoring something to its former good condition or repairing uh, the damage that was done. It's a little bit more of a strong term than remediation. Remediation is fix fixing a small problem or a, a minor fault or deficiency, whereas restoration is taking something that has been very badly destroyed and returning it back to its natural state. So for example, if we were to take a strip mining area and we were to recontour the land and we were to bring in topsoil and replant native vegetation and then monitor that area for five or ten years to make sure that the native species came back, that would be an example of restoration. So we're taking something that was completely destroyed and returning it to its original state. Now these are the four main words you're going to see come up on the AP test. And each one has its own slightly different uh, distinction. So please try and make sure that you learn these so that you'll understand, like if we say that this is a mitigation project, you'll know that that's different than a restoration project. <clears throat> so final question for you. A company destroys a wetland in the process of constructing a building, so they pay to have a portion of land 
restore the wetland habitat in another location nearby. Now this would be an example of A, preservation, B, remediation, C, mitigation, D, restoration, or E, conservation. Go ahead and think about that. If you need to, pause the video now. And the correct answer is mitigation. This is an example of mitigation. Even though we use the word restore to a wetland habitat in the middle of the word there, we're talking about a scenario where a wetland was destroyed in one place and is being rebuilt somewhere else. So that would be mitigation, replacing the wetland that was lost. All right, if you guys have any questions, as always, email me or let me know in class. We'll be discussing some of this just to make sure that you are all up to date on your lectures. And um, we have three other topics that will be posted for this unit, I believe. Um, I think I'm going to cover forests and forest fires. Those might be two separate lectures. And we'll talk about rangelands and we'll talk about urbanization. I'm going to get them posted just as quickly as I can. Um, they do take a little while to put together. But uh, yeah, if you have any questions, let me know. And thank you for listening.